because I think it is so up and coming and it's going to provide such an, an epic service to so many people. I mean, I constantly talk about how many, you know, elderly people probably need medicines, you know, pharmaceuticals, and they can't get out to go get those. And a drone can easily just drop and deliver that off, off to them. And, and, you know, then I started thinking too, all the old folks' homes and neighborhoods and communities that could easily just have all that inf stuff just delivered. I mean, you're, the endless opportunities are there. And it's just like, I think we're all just excited to see it happen, you know? What's even more exciting is now that, you know, the mail is starting to be revolutionized. Logistics is starting to be um, revolutionized. It's, what's exciting for me is the underlying things that we can do with them. So for your point, right, elderly care facilities, if you have somebody who is getting in home or, or they're in some facility, the treatment is, is staggeringly expensive, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in home treatment for an elderly person could be over $100,000 a year easy. And yeah. a lot of that time is not spent on care for that person. It's spent on the logistics of feeding them, getting them their medicine, the essential supplies. And so if we can provide automated delivery of those things, we no longer need to have the high costs of in-home care, right? You can have a nurse come by and check on the person and you don't need to have um, them getting food and coordinating all these other things. And what we see from that is, is one of the systems that, that we're working on for, for a use case like this in particular, um, let's say you have Gladys up in 3A and you deliver meals, medicines, and supplies to her a few times a day from a central location. Um, we know from tracking the data that Gladys always receives her packages and, and gets them out of the, the landing station within 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And that would be 99% certain that that's just her behavior. If we send a, a delivery and she doesn't pick it up for 20 minutes, we now know there is an abnormal behavior. So we can trigger wellness checks. We can trigger somebody to go and check on her, make a yeah. call and say, Gladys, are you okay? And hopefully if there is a situation, we can catch it where it wouldn't have been caught before. So, you know, really tracking how we can use this system, not only to get people their goods, but to improve their lives is what's the, yeah. the really exciting thing for me. Yeah. And like, I mean, even that right there, that's just, that's exciting just for me to hear, because I know that it's just going to be evolution. I mean, evolutionary and re the revolution of this is going to be amazing. It really mm -hmm. is. So I'm excited. I'm excited to see everything that continues to, to grow from all this. It's just going to be amazing. Um, and all that kind of does lead me into my next question. It um, basically with more and more companies um, starting the approval process from the FAA, can you kind of talk about, um, you know, what that process kind of entails? I know, you know, you have to fly up to like 400 hours and things like that, but is there maybe some other things that are required that people don't really know about? Well, I mean, let's put it this way, you know, look at the companies that have gotten 135, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not small operations, no. you know, it's uh, essentially a 30 to 40 man team, uh, two years straight, nonstop to get approval. Yeah. Right. Yep. I mean, it is um, an expensive proposition, and that's why it's kind of been relegated to the giants, right? That's not a bad thing because they're figuring out this process while it's very costly. And then once the FAA has type certification in place, it's, it's much easier because now you have the template to go through. So um, they're really paving the way in a lot of ways for you know, other companies to enter into this. Um, you know, it seems like the regulations are constantly getting improved and, um, you know, gearing towards uh, a full drone network. So, um, you know, there, there's some nuances and it depends on the size of your drone. And, you know, like you said, experience. And, you know, if you have, you know, 400 hours and you've got a few crashes in there, that's a different 400 hours than the 400 clean flight hours, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, you know, those types of things kind of make it a little bit more of a complicated formula. Um, you know, if you're flying over people, if you're adding these risk matrices in there, um, it, it becomes a, a little bit more of a daunting process. And, you know, as Valkyrie, that's why we don't focus on drones. Um, you know, we want to be extremely solid in building landing stations for every customer, whether it's a mailbox, whether it's a drone delivery station or a window unit, it, we want to provide that seamless interface between the customer and the drone. And there is more than enough that needs to go into the thought of that and the design of that. Right. Um, you know, adding drone flights to us would put us 
probably beyond what our capabilities are. So instead we have this universal application and now we can partner with the best in class, right? So yep. Ag Eagle and, and many of our other phenomenal partners across the world, you know, they're they're working on those individual use cases. They're working in those individual geographies and servicing those markets, right? And yep. Right now, there is no best answer. Everybody's still figuring out what works the best, right? So, um, you know, we're taking the approach that we just want to support the industry as a whole, yeah. right? Your mailbox now does not care if it's a UPS package, a USPS package, or an Amazon package. You don't have a different mailbox for each of them. Mm -hmm. right? You need to have this neutral third party mailbox that doesn't determine, right? You don't want Amazon saying, oh, you can't get a package from UPS, right? Yeah you want to have something that is you know able to take traditional deliveries as well as drone deliveries right whether it's medicine meals mail packages right so we designed that our system so the drone companies don't have to they just yep. got to focus on flying keeping that drone safe keeping the people safe and getting the contents from a to b and we'll take care of everything in between yeah yeah that i mean that that's absolutely amazing to hear it, it truly is and i think that you know with with all that stuff that is continuing to evolve with that is just it's, it's extraordinary. And so that kind of, that leads me to a little bit more of another question with that. As, as far as like with the FAA really kind of being strict in the United States is, do you find it Europe's less, I guess, less strict and it's easier to, 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 to uh, I guess I get approvals and fly and do all that things over there. N not necessarily, but that's changing. Um, you know, right now there's some differentiation country to country on, you know, little things that are allowed. Um, there was recently a map published and it kind of showed that it's such a patchwork and it's, it's, there's not one thing that works. And so what we're seeing is none of these countries necessarily have the right answer. And so yeah. they're all kind of working in lockstep, right? One might be six months ahead now and they might be six months behind later, but they're all working towards the same thing. And, um, you know, our partners over at DroneSec in Australia, I was having a conversation with uh, Mike a couple of weeks ago and, you know, this got brought up then. And, you know, he said, look, it's the FAA, it's, it's Transport Canada, it's the European Union, right? When was the last time they had a major crash in their airspace, right? When was the last time you had a loss of life from a major crash, yeah. right? So for us, selfishly, we would want this to move a little faster, but in my opinion, that would be almost um, counterproductive because if we rush these things and somebody gets hurt or yeah. you know not airworthy enough it ends up setting us back right look what happened with autonomous vehicles when they hit a person not even to the fault of the vehicle but it still set the industry back about a year yeah. right yeah and so we don't want to have those same things so while the faa it seems strict now um for me it's it's a necessary strictness it's part of the crawl walk run that they're trying to achieve and all of that is built so we're, we can do this safely and we can do this continuously and there's not these major hang-ups from you know disasters um you know europe is going to be uh implementing the, what they had passed last year and and so january 1st there will be a much more blanketed European uh, airspace criteria for drones. It's not going to be country specific anymore, mm -hmm. um, which is going to really help the industry. Um, but even then, I mean, we're seeing, you know, the, the FAA, now that they're doing beyond and all these other things, they're really advancing these to the next steps, right? Our partners up in Canada, Indro Robotics, you know, they just got approved for BBWAS, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we have partners in, in other parts of the world that have the only BVOS license in their country, right? Yep. And so for us, it's it's more about um, being good stewards of the industry and, and doing our part well, so we're not a weak point in the chain. And, you know, once this next 18 months kind of comes together and we see all of these technologies building one robust system and demonstrating that to the FAA, that's going to be the inflection point. That's when everything explodes. Yeah. And, and I think to hit on that all too, is I think what is very unique about you guys is you can, like you said too, numerous times, you're supporting everything that's going on. So when the drone was solely focused on and there, all these <clears throat> big companies are going through that process, they may not nece necessarily have to worry about what it's going to land on. Right. You guys are able to supply that. So you don't have to worry about, you know, how the drone is functioning necessarily, but you, you can, 
supply that product to that company and say, hey, look, we, we know our product's good here. You're good to go. And they can focus on that FAA approval or whatever else they need to get approvals on. I think that's awesome. And, you know, I, I'm glad the FAA is kind of strict. I think, I, I think it's going to make more people feel comfortable. I think once, you know, because they are so strict, more people are going to be like, okay, I can understand this. There's less likely to have accidents. There's less likely things are going to happen and occur from this. So when they do see drones flying through the air and delivering packages, they're going to be more comfortable and acceptable that, and then they may be more likely to order and, and do it that way as well. So those are things I was kind of thinking of from that. Um, but Absolutely. yeah, um, my, you kind of hit on it a little bit. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to ask this one anyways. Um, obviously, with the pandemic we're currently in, and it's still having a major impact on the economy, and more and more people are starting to order products online, as we saw with Black Friday and we saw with Cyber Monday. Um, and then people are you know, more likely to do food deliveries through Uber Eats and Postmates and Grubhub and all that. Have you seen more of a, a pressure I guess you could say on starting to get deliveries completed by drone and yes. okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say that our demand increased uh, probably at least 10 X from COVID and our timelines got accelerated in some cases, you know, three, 400%. Um, you know, it seems like what was, there wasn't a real hurry towards drone delivery, right? I mean, there was steps being taken, but there wasn't this, you know, existential need like there is now, right? Yeah. I mean, we're leaving your house might be a life or death situation. If we can provide contactless delivery to every single person that needs it, right? Uh, it, it, not only that, but building that in with healthcare, right? We've seen, uh, you know, tremendous growth in the, the healthcare delivery market more than anything. And, you know, when you start looking at our landing stations being implemented, now, in, in collaboration with telehealth, you can have a patient go do a telehealth appointment with their doctor, say, I have symptoms. The doctor says, great, we'll send you a test, right? They'll, they'll send it by drone. It'll be in your landing station or your mailbox. You go there, you get it, you swab your mouth, put it back in. The drone picks it up, takes it right to the lab. If it tests positive, now we can schedule meals and medicine coming to you for the next 14 days. You never have to leave your house. Um, so that would be the ultimate goal is you know, whatever you need, it, yep. it will be able to be delivered by drone and, and COVID accelerated that. And, you know, it's one of the few silver linings of COVID, I would say. Yeah. Well, and that, yeah. And I think that that's kind of been unique too, is because you're starting to see a lot of, I guess, sectors like fitness as well, you know, and just use the example Peloton, you know, Peloton was kind of doing its thing. And then the pandemic hit and it's like, holy smokes, like this is have done wonders for the likes of a Peloton. And mm -hmm. I think it's going to start doing more and more for sectors, obviously, like, we know what Amazon is all about, but it only assisted them even further. And I think that that's going to, you know, help catapult drone deliveries and all that as well. Um, so in a way it, I mean, obviously, it's a it's a terrible, terrible thing. But I think there we can draw some positives from the pandemic as well. So I, I would agree with that. You know, I mean, we were we were very nervous in the beginning. Um, you know, we had some investors that got wiped out in that early market crash and some money we were counting on didn't come in. You know, several members of our team have contracted COVID over the last nine months, um, you know, and so it's it's definitely had its challenges, you know, but overall for the industry, it's it's done tremendous. Yeah. And I think it just shows too how as a world where we can evolve with things like this. I mean, it's amazing to just see, like I said before, the evolution of just, you know, kind of getting hit, taking it and then just learning from it and growing from it. And then I guess basically creating new things around it. And it's just, it's amazing to see. I can't thank you enough, Ryan. It's a privilege to have you on here for multiple reasons. Um, it truly is amazing. Uh, just I want you to know you are my first interview and uh, it, it's been a complete blast. It truly has. Um, like I said, I can't thank you enough. This is amazing. So uh, yeah, I the same way. I really appreciate you having me on and I hope we can uh, do this again when we have some updates to share and us and Ag Eagle and some of the other people have made some exciting announcements and we can talk about it here. For sure. That sounds amazing. Let's do it. 
Uh, well, Ryan Walsh, co-founder um, and CEO, current CEO of Valkyrie.